evening. How's everyone doing? Like I said, I'm Jason, and I guess I'm pretty good. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. <laughs> you know, really, if, if anyone's any good stand up for a church, then I would say God is good. Amen. God is good, and luckily they got out of the way to let God speak through them. And, and we always uh, we always go to this text. But before we go there, um, we're going to be in, in Mark chapter um, 5. But before we go, let's say a prayer. And let's ask God to just inspire us and the Spirit to take over. Heavenly Father, we're here. Uh, we love you, and we sense and we know that the, the Bible is true, that, that you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus, not only to die for us, but to live a life worth following, worth emulating. And Jesus, we thank you so much for your amazing grace. That, that as we mess up, you clean up. Uh, and, and we just thank you so much for covering our sins and our mistakes with your blood and your sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, we also thank you for your Holy Spirit that uh, was sent to us as a helper, a counselor, as uh, to, for us to be empowered to, to know your truth, to look at your love letter, the Bible, and, and discern what you want us to take away and how you want us to, to live. So I pray, Spirit, would you just come now and anoint this, this place? Would, would you help me decrease in my flesh? And would your spirit just come alive uh, through what I have to say? And we do it all because we love you. Jesus, we want your name to be famous here in, in Newport, here on the coast, and in, in this world. And so, Lord, just take over. Steal the show tonight. Amen. 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 All right, so we're going to talk about how to faith the storms of life uh, tonight. Not face, but faith the storms of life. We prayed, we, we sang about storms, and I was like, how did he know? I'm like, an awesome choice of songs. I don't know if Seth told him, I don't think so, so that was pretty cool, that's a God thing. Um, so, we all face storms, right? Raise your hand if you ever face a storm in your life. Yeah, proverbial, boom, storms hit. Uh, the ability to faith the storms of our lives, uh, it's more of a verb, it's not really a noun. But um, I think one of the most difficult jobs that there would ever be would be a weather forecaster on the coast. You know, like a meteorologist? Trying to like get, get the weather right and, and all those things. I don't even. I would not want that job. There would be so much like really. Dude, I would be very general in my descriptions. And people like, what does he mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So there's a story about a, a Native American chief who was asked by his tribe, um, "What's the winter going to be like? Is it going to be a cold winter?" And so the guy didn't want them to really know he didn't know, so he goes away and he says, I'll be right back. And he goes and he calls the National Weather Service. <laughs> and he says, so I need to know, is this winter coming up going to be a cold one? And he says, you know, we're, we're fairly certain that it's going to be a cold winter. So the chief says, thank you very much. Brings up the phone, comes out, so says to his tribe, friends, we need to cut and stack lots of firewood because it's going to be I'm pretty certain it's going to be a cold winter. And so they go to town, and they're falling trees and chopping wood, and finally a few weeks later, they come back to the chief, and they're like, chief, so what do you think now? Is it, how cold is it going to be? And he goes, one, one moment. He steps up and calls the National Weather Forecasting, and, he, and the guy says, we're actually more certain than before it's going to be a very cold winter. Great, thank you very much. Click, goes back, they, they're just chopping more firewood, stacking more firewood, finally, the final question gets asked in front of the whole tribe, Chief, the, the, the winter, what's it going to be like? One moment, he finally makes the last call, and the guy says, we are positive beyond a shadow of a doubt that this will be one of the most severe winters we've ever had. And the Chief said, thanks. He almost goes to hang up and says, hold on one second. How do you know for sure? And he says, because the Indians are cutting and stacking firewood like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> Well, 
Like broke it or just blew it up? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> 95 to Okay, in 95 to Bruce off? Yep, in the fire. I want to see it start like the roof off the school. Just rip the roof. Yeah. 100 miles an hour. Okay, you were talking about, was that you? I was talking about that I asked you about that? Was it? Someone I asked about, yeah, what did you remember? Oh, I just remember the road getting taken off the Bay Shore and down all the work. The Bay Shore and down. Right, and what year do you think that was back? It was in the 80s. 80s. Yeah. Well, I looked it up, and Wikipedia says, <laughs> it says October 12, 1962 was the, one of the oh, worst storms of all time. There was like a 1933 one, but there wasn't much, you know, any eyewitnesses left, so. Um, but anyways, in 1962, the system brought strong winds to the Pacific Northwest, even Southwest Canada. It was linked to 43 uh, fatalities in the Northwest. Resulting from heavy winds and then also mudslides in Northern California. The peak winds were felt as the storm passed close by on October 12th. At Oregon's Cape Blanco, uh, 145 miles per hour. The gusts got up to. Some reports uh, the peak blast was 179, uh, just, out, just off the coast. Yikes. I remember one of the worst storms, um, literally, outside was when we were living in California. And this really wasn't a necessarily a bad storm, but it was a windstorm. But previously, it had dumped, dumped, dumped inches of rain. And I don't know what you felt. I'm just going to talk to you fellas. But do your wives ever ask me the craziest questions at like the middle of the night or right before bed? And they want you to go do something? And you're like, I'm in bed. I just got comfortable. And you want me to go check the front door, or you want me to go check the dog, or whatever, right? So my wife, Angela, right there, way back there, she's the cute little one with the, the gray hat. We just get in bed, and actually I'm woken up, I believe, correct me if I'm my guest, to her saying, would you please get up and move the van? And I'm like, what? What kind of question? Who says that? I'm like, I must be dreaming, so I rolled over and fell back asleep. And just a few, I don't know, minutes, I fell back asleep. A huge oak tree falls on our van. Bam! Because there was just a nasty windstorm, and she thought, no, that tree could come down. And I'm thinking, no way. No way. And sure enough, I stayed in bed, and the van got crushed. Totally. And it was like perfectly across that van. I'm like, you couldn't even have placed it better with a crane. It just went right on, just totally made it. And so that was one of the worst storms that blew a tree over on our house. We're going to talk today uh, about the Sea of Galilee. I want to show you a kind of little picture of it behind me. And this Sea of Galilee is like large, very large. It's 600 feet below sea level. It's actually a, you can kill those sounds. But basically it's, it's 600 feet below sea level. It's actually a freshwater lake. And uh, it's like seven miles wide shaped like a heart, and about 14 miles long. So on any given night, when Jesus asked his disciples to go to the other side of the sea, this is the story we're going to read, Jesus in the storm when he fell asleep, and the disciples, it would have taken about three hours to sail or row across the Sea of Galilee, as you saw. And so the interesting thing about the sea is it had like mountains that kind of surrounded parts of it, and so these winds would whip up off the mountains and come down and just Form these storms that would just come out of nowhere. So we're in Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35. I'm going to read for a little bit and read the story, and then we're going to unpack this story. Alright, so that day, uh, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side, talking about the sea. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Wouldn't it be great if our kids would obey like this storm? <laughs> Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? 
They were terrified, and they asked each other, who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So, it begs the question, if we're going to try to find some application from this, when we face storms, do we fearfully focus on the storm, or do we, do we faithfully focus on Jesus? We look at the disciples in this story, and they were focused on, these guys were fishermen. They knew their way around, some of them were, they knew their way around boats. Right? And so these dudes get to the point of, well, let's wake up Jesus, because we're going now. And so do you fearfully focus on the storm, or do you faithfully focus on Christ? That's one of the first thoughts and questions. Now, as I'm talking, why don't you think about, I asked a few people, my wife even, before, what's one of the worst storms you've ever had to face in your life? What's one of the worst circumstances? What's one of the worst things? And she, my wife said her health. She's had cancer four times, and she's got cancer now, and she just battles over, the, over time and time again. She had a brain tumor when she was 10. So it's like her health has been her, her lifelong storm. And I would say that I've learned by living with and watching her battle her health and become like a survivor time and time again, beat cancer and stop cancer over and over, she has a certain kind of faith that is a product of being a survivor and knowing where to put her focus. And I, I'm a fearful dude, and so I still find myself focusing on the storm, focusing on her, the health, focusing on what if, and, and not focusing so much on Christ and, and keeping my mind right and my heart right. So I've learned this from her in some ways. But here's some lessons we can learn as we kind of look back into this text. You can be close to Jesus and still encounter storms. Am I right? Yeah, some Christians make the mistake of thinking that just because uh, they have this, the Lord of their life, that they're going to be absent, they're going to be storm-proof. Right? No tribulation, no problems, I'm good. There's even Christians that I'll meet when they are in a storm that they're so positive with Christ that I'm like... I love that they're kind of leading into the, this isn't going to take them to hit. There's a reality check that we have to have sometimes. It's like, okay, Lord, I'm going to face this storm, but give me some discernment. Give me some wisdom on how. You know what I'm saying? You can almost be blindfully positive about certain things and not really understand. So there are all types of storms. Uh, I mentioned Evangelist Physical health storms. Uh, there's financial storms that come into our lives. There's emotional storms, uh, emotional IQ. Uh, there's relational storms, for sure, uh, that they hit suddenly without no warning. But just because you find yourself in a storm doesn't mean that God doesn't love you, or I've heard so many young people as well, as we work with a lot of young people, so many young people think that when storms happen, God's punishing them. That it's a cause and effect. Oh, where do I even deserve this, God? Like, what? Maybe if I just get back on track, then these storms will go away. And so we try to teach them. That's not how to look at it. Jesus led the disciples into the storm. In our text, in Mark, he led them there. He said, "Hey, let's go to the other side." Do you think Jesus knew what he was doing? Do you think this storm, this storm, caught Jesus off guard? Uh huh. So. I guess, I don't know, are you going through a storm right now? You shouldn't be surprised if you are following Christ. Storms will come. The Bible says, dear friends, this is 1 Peter 4.12, and then also 4.16. Uh, are you going through a storm right now? So, dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering. Because these are Peter's words. As though something strange were happening to you. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. That we are followers of Christ and that we can't have a new perspective when the storms come. Okay, sometimes trouble comes like waves, doesn't it? You might be in between waves. You might be just coming up for air from a wave uh, that, that has hit you, but another one's coming. There was a, a guy on a ranch being chased by a bull. And he saw this hole in the ground. He jumps into the hole and the bull can't get down there, so the bull runs by. And the guy jumps out of the hole, and the bull sees him, and comes running again, and he can't get, so he jumps back in the hole. And this repeats like four or five times. Finally, one of his buddies sees what's going on, distracts the bull, and the guy jumps out of the hole, and he runs to the fence, hops over before the bull comes. 
And the dude's like, what was going on? Why didn't you just stay in the hole until the bull ran off? He goes, because there was a rattlesnake in the hole. <laughs> you ever feel like that sometimes? Like, darn if you do, darn if you don't. It's like, I'm, I'm going to jump from this storm, and then the next one's coming. It just comes wave after wave. Uh, there was a prophet in the Old Testament. His name was Amos. And he wrote this in Amos 5.19. He says, um, that sometimes a man runs from a lion only to meet a bear. And then he says, when he finally gets home, he leans on his wall and there's also a snake. And it's like, he can't get away from trouble. This type of man. Life can be tough. Christians, we are not immune uh, to the storms. All of us encounter them. Second thing we kind of learned, Jesus permits storms to test our faith. It's a testing of our faith. When the disciples woke Jesus, he immediately responded with two questions. He says what? What's the first question? you remember? Why are you so afraid? What's the next question? Yeah, why don't you have any faith? Why are you so afraid? Why don't you have any faith? I think if we were to just stop right here and say, where do you stand? Where do you sit? Where's your heart with those two questions tonight? What are you so fearful of tonight that's going on in your life? Is it something from your past that might catch up to you? Or is it something in your future that you're uncertain about? What are you afraid of? And then why do you have such little faith? Great questions from Jesus that are still relevant today. Isn't it great God's word is, is the same and it is relevant yeah. yesterday, today, and tomorrow? I just love that. Love it. Uh, again, we go to Peter and he says in 1 Peter 1 7, he says, These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, through, though your faith is far more precious than your gold. So here's some of the ways I think God tests us. One test is what I call the pressure test. This is like the faith test. Uh, how will you handle stress when you are at your limit? Think of a pressure cooker. How do you react when you get the, uh, the, the POTD, the point of total desperation? You're at the end of your rope. Uh, think of the pressure cooking uh, cooker. Steam pressure's coming. How do you react? Are you going to explode in anger? Will you keep the lid on and trust God until it finally dies down? That's the pressure test. When pressure comes, how do we respond? Do we lose our top? The second one is the people test. This one seems to happen a lot to me. The people test. Sometimes God puts people in your life who will stretch your faith. They will stretch your patience. Uh, extra grace required. Type, right? It's like, oh Lord, you are testing me right now. And if you don't know or have anyone in your life that you're thinking of, you are the one. Okay? I'm just saying. We all have them. They rub you the wrong way. They seem to find your one exposed nerve, and they're just playing a little fiddle on it, you know? All right. It's not that they're hard for you to love. You might think they're impossible for me to love. But admit this. Jesus loves them anyways, right? Jesus loves them as he loves you, and sometimes... We have a people test. We have people in our lives that we have to figure out how to love and maybe work with or maybe live with, maybe be in a family with. Uh, there's all different types of people tests. How can you learn to patiently love them like Jesus? The next one is a persistence test. When storms come, how persistent will you be? How long will it take until you feel like throwing in the towel, raising the white flag and saying, I give up, I quit? If, if, you, if, you, if you look at different case studies of people who have had breakthroughs, whether it's medicine, uh, finances, whether it's an entrepreneur in a business, at the point of like total desperation, those who like persevered usually broke through some kind of barrier, and bam, that's when things started working, things started clicking. How about for you in your life? I wonder if you have stories of like, yeah, I was just ready to quit, and I did it. So there's a, there's a persistence test. God rewards you when you pass the faith test. Now, sometimes we hear this sound. Let's go ahead and play this sound that we, no one wants to hear, but when you hear it, you stop what you're doing. Ready? 
these objects are of extraterrestrial origin. The cross has to be quiet point. at this time for your sake. There it is. <laughs> That's it. I don't know if you're driving or if you're at home. Can you hear this annoying sound? What's the first thing they usually say? Oh, we're gonna let it play. It's so annoying. <laughs> they say, usually this is a test. This message is being broadcast by the Department of Defense of the Republic. At 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, multiple unidentified. <laughs> that was like a UFO emergency conference. That's all I could find for the headset. No UFOs have been sighted in Newport. Okay, you're safe. You're safe. That would be cool. We hear, so we have to remember sometimes we're in the middle of a storm, we're working through a people test, a persistence test, a patience test, and we have to remember, man, this is just a test. I gotta keep working through this. This is only a test. Turn to someone and say, just a test. Just a test. So pass the test. Because if you don't, you're gonna have to retake that class. Who wants to repeat? Right? So many of us are in this rhythm of repeating. We try hard, we do good, and we fail. We don't learn. And then we just try harder, we do better, but then fail again. We're like, this record is broke. So it's just a test. Storms, my third point. Storms force us to cry out to Jesus. Think of the disciples, okay? Several of them were fishermen, like I shared before. I suspect they were trying everything. They were bailing the water. They probably brought down the mast and did the sail. They're like, we need to figure out what to do before we, we sink to the bottom. It soon became apparent that their resources were not enough and that they needed to wake up Jesus. And then he asked them those questions. You know, don't you care if we drown Jesus? They were not afraid of the storm. They were afraid of drowning. You know, they were afraid of dying. Sometimes when we're in our storm, our minds rush to the worst case scenario. You know anyone like that? Are you that person? I can tend to get there. Worst case guy, kind of go right to the bar end and go, wow, this is the worst that could happen. Or you ever say that? Well, what's the worst that could happen? And you're like, don't say that! Right? And so maybe you're that type of person. Well, these disciples were definitely in that. Hey, this is, this is worst case. We're there. And so, God, don't you care that I'm going through a tough time? You ever said that to God the Father? God, don't you care that I'm struggling here? Can't you see that I'm, I'm barely making, I'm barely treading water? I've been there. I mean, come on. Pastor Seth and I, I could probably say we've been there more times than most. I mean, it's a reality of living the, the faith life, right? We trust Him. And when we trust Him, we take steps where maybe we wouldn't normally in our mind, but you go there. Or you just fill in the blank. We've all been there, I believe. You don't have to wonder, does God care? We know that that's true because we trust what the Bible says. Amen? That, that if it is truth, then we need to understand that it's, it is what we, we can believe, we can bank on it. Do you know what's in your Bible? Say yes or no to these phrases. Is this yes in the Bible or no it isn't? Okay, ready? God helps those who help themselves. No. No, it's not in the Bible. There's a good crowd. Pastor, you're doing good. You're doing a good job. God won't lay on you more than you can bear. It's not in the Bible. The Bible does say he won't tempt you beyond what you can resist. Similar, but it's not the same. The golden rule, is that in the Bible? No. It's, there's, there's, there's proverbs and words very similar to what you should do to others based on how you would do it to yourself. So when it comes to adversity and trouble, God will allow you to be burdened. He will allow you to have storms to the point where you realize you cannot fix it yourself. You see that? You get to the point where you're like, I can't do this myself. It's actually the, the first or second step in, in uh, an addiction recovery class. It says you realize that you have a problem, A. B is you realize you don't have the power to heal, help yourself. You need an outside source. <clears throat> right? AA calls it a higher power. It's Jesus, y'all. <laughs> That's what it is. The person who wrote AA was a Christian, but he needed to use it for other purposes than the church. So he 
put in higher power. Like a doorknob could be someone's higher power. Come on. It's Jesus. What if the disciples had been saying that? What if a disciple had said something like, uh, hey, let's not wake him up right now. Uh, we can handle this. You know, after all, God won't put more on us than we can handle. Right? Come on, guys. Let's, let's just ride this out. What's the worst that could happen? You know, what if they had said that? It would be, you would have heard a sound like, blub, 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 as the boat, you know, I doubt that Jesus was in the boat, you know. But just, how many times do we do that in life? I'm guilty of it way too many times. i got to be reminded by loved ones, like my wife or my kids. It's like, Dad, you're doing it, like, in your power, not God's. I'm like, oh, how can I get that? I have to take that test over a lot. My power, not his. So, it's when life is unbearable, that's when we're forced to cry out to God. Paul said this. He understood in talking about some of his personal trials. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 1, 8, 9. He says this. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest church planners, missionaries to ever walk this earth. He said, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. Paul is saying, this is beyond our ability to endure. So that, we, uh, so that we despaired even life itself. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. But on God. Jesus, here's the fourth point. Jesus will enter, or he'll either calm the storm, like he did in this text, or he will calm you in the midst of the storm. Okay? We see that time and time again. He doesn't always remove us and pluck us out of the storm, but he will give us a peace that surpasses our understanding. Okay? I love the fact that Jesus was asleep. Like, really? That would make, like, good Hollywood, you know, movie, film. But he's asleep. Of course he is. Jesus is asleep in the storm. I'm sure the waves were rocking, but Jesus is Jesus. This teaches us several things. First, Jesus was a man who experienced fatigue. Okay? He experienced fatigue. He was tired. He's like, hey, let's get to the other side. There's lots of crowds here. Let's get away. Let's get quiet. Let's recharge. The dude was tired. He needed a nap. He needed to recharge. He, he gets fatigued just like us. He did. We also see he possessed such a strong sense of tranquility, peace, harmony, shalom, that he could sleep through the storm. So there were two storms present that night. There was the physical storm happening, and there was the emotional storm raging inside the disciples. They were filled with fear. Fear could be more destructive than a hurricane. Um, fear. Did anyone know this guy back here? This next picture? Who knows? Old timers listen to the radio a lot? Paul Harvey. All right. 500 Jesus points right there. You. Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey it was a great radio voice. He would talk his, his radio show. He would say, and now for the rest of the story. He would tell a story, take a time out. He knew how to have a dramatic pause, share a little advertisement or something, and then maybe come back and finish the story. Or he would just tell a story in an amazing way. Here's one of them. He used to tell of a chicken farmer in Tennessee who suspected a fox was raiding uh, the chicken house that night. He was losing eggs, and he was losing hands. So one night, he put his loaded shotgun by his bed and stayed awake. He heard uh, a ruckus from a hen house, so he slipped down into the night, uh, wearing nothing but his nightshirt. And as he approached the dark hen house, fear began to set in. And then as I read, he began to wonder, what if that fox attacks me? What if it's not a fox? What if it's a cooter? Or something like that. And as he stood at that, the doorway to the hen house, these thoughts are swirling in his mind, right? Picture this farmer in his nightgown, looking at the dark door of the chicken coop with his shotgun, getting ready to walk in. At that precise moment, his old faithful hound dog, Blue, crept up behind him and cold nosed him under his night. <laughs> you ever have a dog kind of give you that little nose bump in the back of the leg? Well, guess what? Boom! The shotgun goes off. He killed nine hens. Nine hens. Kablam. Now, Paul Harvey says, he used to say that shotgun didn't kill those hands. Fear did. Fear did. Jesus said, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? 
Then he spoke to the wind and the waves and said, hush, they fell silent. Be still. Those were the kind of words that a mother would speak to a, trying, a crying child, right? Hey, shh, hush, be still. It's going to be okay. My mom would say those things. My wife said it to all four of our kids about a hundred times. Shh, 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 hold on. It's going to be okay. Be wise, quiet down. Shh, 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 shh. All of a sudden, boom, they're snoring logs again. You know? And so the Bible says it was completely calm. If you look at the Greek text, there was a great calm. The word is mega. It was mega calm. I don't know what that even means. Have you ever experienced mega calm on a, on a lake? I haven't. Sounds cool, right? There was this mega calm. In this case, Jesus took the storm away. But sometimes he doesn't remove the storm. Instead, he speaks to our troubled hearts. He says, hush, be still, be quiet. To your heart. So, Paul had a storm he called a thorn in his flesh, the Apostle Paul. He called this storm in his life, this, this challenge, this test in his life, a thorn in his flesh. God didn't remove it. He did not take it away. One of the greatest followers of Christ who planted the churches that started it all, he wouldn't take it away. If he won't take away Paul's pain, then, then what do we have to say and think about ours? Paul wrote this about his, his test, his pain. 2 Corinthians 12. To me, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. He even calls it a messenger of Satan. To torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Say that with me. My grace is sufficient for you. Those are the words of Christ to you in your heart tonight. He goes on to say, Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about what? My weakness. So that Christ's power may rest on me. Christ's power, not his. Some of you have been asking God to take away your storm for a long time. He hasn't done it, has he? But he is offering you inner tranquility. He's offering you mega calm. Mega calm tonight. The final point I want to make is if Jesus is in your boat, you know you'll make it through the storm. You know you'll make it. In the midst of the storm, the disciples had forgotten that Jesus said, hey, let's go over to the other side. If Jesus said it, then I believe it's going to happen. So we, we need to understand God's truth, the, the truth of what Christ said, some of his promises to us. Once the creator of the universe makes up his mind that he's going to the other side, guess what? It will happen. You're not stopping it. A hurricane couldn't stop it. I mean, Caesar and all his armies and navies couldn't stop it. Satan won't stop it, as Jesus said. They were going to the other side, as Jesus spoke it. And Jesus has promised his followers, you and I, that we'll make it through our storms. One way or another. Whether it's for our safety or God's glory, we will make it through our storm. It will be used for, according to his purpose. So God never promised we wouldn't live a storm-proof life. Sorry, guys. Not good news. Not great news. But I love the way uh, Eugene Peterson puts it. Eugene Peterson wrote this great paraphrase. It's not the scriptures, but it's this really great paraphrase. Another way of thinking about the Bible in the Message Bible. Love it. And he says this. This is Isaiah 43. 2 through 7. But he says, when you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Amen? Because I am God. I'm your personal God. I paid a huge price for you, and that's how much you mean to me. Let me say that again. Just recognize how valuable you are to God. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. So don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. I'm here. I'm right here, buddy. I remember uh, walking with our oldest, his name's Hunter, 
when he was just a baby. And for whatever reason, I was caught up in the rain, and he starts crying. And he's just screaming, crying. And, and I'm like whispering and holding him tight. I got my hood over him and me. And, and I'm just like whispering those words, right? Like a mother to their baby. It's going to be okay, buddy. We'll get back. And it's going to be okay. And he's screaming. From his perspective, it, there's thunderstorms. Uh, there's, there's lightning. And it's like the world's going to end. From my perspective, I'm like, dude, it's going to be fine. I got you. And I think we so many times flip roles. You know, we got now. Now, if you were to look back at that moment, and let's say my son now is 23, yeah, he's 23, and basically, I had to double check with my wife. You know, she back checks me. You know, it's like everybody does a Trump. Um, <laughs> keeps me honest. So no. So here's the deal. Just imagine Hunter, 23 years old, walks into like a therapist and has this like issue that the therapist like digs up and it's called the storm. And he remembers this storm in his in his life. And he's like, man, I don't know why my dad would let me out there in the rain and the thunder and lightning. He risked my life. And I had so much fear and it caused this fear of whatever, and phobias, whatever. You know? And I'd be like, man, that would suck. But from my perspective, I have to hold my son and walk him to safety. You know, while he's screaming, crying, and I calmed him down. And I wouldn't trade that. That, that was a precious moment. Uh, he trusted Dad over the storm eventually before he got back to the house. I would never trade that. And I think God's so much similar, where He's like, "You want to be like taken out and stormproof, but I love holding you. I love telling you, hey, I'm right here. So feed your faith, not your fear. I think that's what God the Father is saying to us. Feed your faith. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up. The greatest Maritime disaster in the history was what? Titanic. Huh? Titanic. Yeah, 500 pieces points to the second row. <laughs> the Titanic, I still would say, is probably one of the worst still to this day. The Titanic. Let me tell you a few things you maybe haven't heard about this Titanic sinking. It wasn't the storm, right, that sank the Titanic. It was an iceberg. We know this. But it was also the pride and the hubris of the shipbuilders. They called it an unsinkable ship. It's supposed to be. That's all she ever did, though, was the sink. One of the crew members commented to uh, Miss, Mrs. Sylvia Caldwell when she boarded. The crew member said, God himself couldn't sink this ship. Uh, yeah. We all know the tragic story. There weren't enough lifeboats, or 100, I think 1,500 people, over 1,500 died. Here's something that maybe you haven't heard. The Titanic was built in Belfast, Northern Ireland. In Belfast. After the news of the sinking, the people of Bel Belfast took to the streets, weeping and wailing. Grown men were hugging and weeping over the fact that the ship of all ships built in their town failed. Sank. They cried bitter tears. It sank on Monday. Okay? So the Titanic sinks on a Monday. The following Sunday at, at, at Derry uh, Presbyterian Church in Belfast, there was a great sadness because 16 men who were members of that church had been on the boat as engineers. They built it, so they're building their engineers that were helping it be, you know, become what it was. We're also on the boat making sure it went and functioned. 16 of them uh, all drowned in the icy waters of the North Atlantic. The church was packed to overflowing that Sunday. And the pastor's name is Andrew Smith. He chose to preach on the very text that we studied today. And he said this, I quote, There was only one vessel in all of history that was truly unsinkable. The little boat occupied by the sleeping Savior. And then he added, And the only hearts that can weather the storms of life are the hearts with Jesus inside. Amen. You notice the last things the disciple asked. The disciples said these things after the storm, after the mega, mega calm. They say, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey. Great question. Who is Jesus to you tonight? I believe that when people encounter the living Christ, they are never the same. That they truly encounter Jesus, they are not the same. That they are changed in some way, whether it's great or small. 
Who is Jesus to you tonight? Who is this man? There's a pastor called um, S.M. Lockridge, and he became famous. It was about 1987 for a little speech, a six and a half minute speech he gave called That's My King. And um, it's like we, we've heard it, it's so good. I, I'm going to just read a little clip to it for you. But his, uh, his you know what the S.M. stands for? S.M. Lockridge? This is kind of cool. Anybody who's like, you know, going to have a baby anytime sooner or dinner babies? His name was Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. Okay, not a good idea, but it's still cool. That's why he went by S.M. Okay? I still think it's kind of cool. All right. He says this. I wish I could more accurately describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. And we learned today, I'm adding this, he's unsinkable. Right? You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, and they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't fault him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't conquer him, and the grave couldn't hold him. He says, my friends, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the God of the future and the God of your past. He is Jesus, and you can trust him. Who is Jesus to you? Have you put your trust in him? So many of us are doing two things as I wrap this up. If you want to bring up to the stage, you have a song, you can get ready. So many of us do that little thing that I call the cycle of try hard, do good, fail. To get back on the saddle and try harder, do better, and still fail. You're trying so hard. Maybe tonight you need to come to the reality that there is this sacred rhythm that Jesus lays out to stop trying so hard and start trusting God more. Because God can give us, through his wisdom and discernment, a way to try smarter, not harder. Amen. Okay? I think God might be saying that to you tonight. What am I working so hard at that I just keep coming up empty or fail? Maybe I need to be trusting more. Maybe I need to be praying more. Jesus has a seat of authority in all of our lives. Let me, let me explain. Um, we, when we come to Jesus, we give Jesus this seat of authority, okay? I have my mask up here. So sorry. Okay. So, Someone comes to Christ, and they basically are saying, Jesus, I trust you with my life. I, I want you to be not just my Savior, but my Lord, the Lord of my life every day. And so Jesus, I want you to have a seat. I make every decision for my life from this stool. So go ahead. I'm getting off. It's yours. All right, so there's Jesus. He's on the stool, and you're like, this is so fun. Jesus, man, make good decisions. You know, and you're like, and then the first thing happens that challenges you. I don't know, uh, one for me, uh, my finances. God, how are we going to pay the bills? I know I'm supposed to still tithe, but man, I should really use that couple hundred bucks to pay the car bill. And, then, and we kind of do one of these. We kind of get back on the chair a little bit. Now we're sharing it with Jesus. You know, we're like, are we, are we good? You know, maybe we're like, hey, you know, we're holding on to Jesus right here. And then we get other situations where it's like, yeah, I know that I should forgive him, but it hurts so much. And he knew exactly what he was doing. And I, I don't, I can't forget. Jesus, I can't. And, we, we, and so what I would say to you is, don't be a one cheap Christian. <laughs> Give Jesus the full seat of authority. Don't get cheeky with Jesus. There's another one. <laughs> right? Give it to him. Let him make the decisions for your life. Understand, learn from him. But don't jump back on that seat of authority. Trust in him. Amen. He will make your path straight. Trust in Him with all your heart. And then that peace will come. That surpasses all understanding. Amen? Amen? Let me say a prayer and then we'll respond with some worship. Jesus, help us to trust you. Help us not get cheeky with you. Jesus, help us to understand that we need to pass the test. That some of these things are just a test. Help us to persevere. Help us to keep our eyes on you in the midst of that storm. And Lord, if you're not going to calm the storm, then calm us. Calm our hearts. Calm our minds. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. What a great example you are. All God's people said. Amen.